Welcome to part one of what might become a series of presentations about the flora of Columbia County. With these presentations, I would like to begin sharing with you some of what I have learned about the wild plants that surround us. Today, after a brief introduction into the history of my own explorations of the flora here, I will review some basic botanical concepts that are useful when trying to identify plants and that help you see some of the patterns in the plant world. And then after that, I will just introduce you to um, some examples of spring flowering plant families. We will talk about lilies, mustards, buttercups, arums, and violets. So I have been documenting the wild growing plants in our county for almost two decades now. And I was very lucky that my husband, who is right here, um, who loves books and who loves particularly old books, stumbled across this unassuming publication that's called Flora of the Columbia County Area. It is based on field observations that were made in the 1930s, but the book was not published until 1958. And again, thanks to Conrad, we found out that the author, Rogers McVaugh, who had become a professor of botany at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, was still alive, enjoying emeritus status at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And a year before his death at the age of 100, we got to visit Rogers and hear his tales of botanical explorations in Columbia County more than 80 years ago. His flora became the basis for my own study of the plants in our county. When you open that book, um, it seems like a very dry and technical document, but it is a treasure trove of information for the more than 1,200 plants that Rogers found during his studies. He gives detailed accounts of their habitats. For example, with the yellow lady slipper, he says it lives in rich, often calcareous woods how common or rare the plants were. Here he says it was frequent. And for a lot of the plants, he even gives specific locations where he has found them. <clears throat> Starting with this baseline and complementing the information with more recent records gleaned from the New York Flora Atlas, which is an excellent online resource, as well as our own observations, we created a digital checklist of the plants of Columbia County, which has one row dedicated for each species of plants <clears throat> that we know occur here. The list currently contains 1,554 plant species and can be viewed and downloaded from our website. Um, here is the link. At the end of the presentation, I will um, show a resource page where all these links are um, given one more time. So you can always go back to that and pull them from there. So our checklist um, includes for each plant the botanical family it belongs to, its scientific name, the common name, whether the plant is native or not native in our area, or whether it's considered an invasive species, how common or rare it is nowadays, <clears throat> according to our own observations, um, at the county level, at the level of the Hudson Valley, and at the level of New York State, what our best guess is about the trend of its population, whether it's declining, whether it's the same as was Rogers' um, observed in the 1930s, or whether it's actually increasing, like some of our invasive plants. And then uh, we also included some of the information from the flora of Columbia County, um, how rare it was then, and what habitat Rogers associated with the plant. And then there's also information about the life form of the plants. So this format then allows us to sort all the plants by different criteria, um, or you can go in and you can look at all the plants in a certain plant family that we know occur in Columbia County. Um, and one can analyze the flora as a whole um, according to different criteria. For example, 
life form. Uh, we can tally up and see how many of the plants in Columbia County are herbaceous perennial species. And we see that almost half of our species are herbaceous per perennial or biennial plants. Uh, we can see that almost a quarter of our species are graminoids, that means grasses or, and sedges. Um, around, yeah, a little bit more than 100 species are trees, 150 are shrubs, and so on. So one gets an idea of what our flora is actually composed of. And then, oops, and then one can also um, analyze and see so how many of the plants that we have wild growing around us right now are actually originally native here and which ones are not native and how um, is that distributed over the different life forms. So we can see that, for example, um, all our ferns are native. We don't have any non-native ferns here. Most of our trees are native, although we have a few non-native ones here. We can see that half of the annual herbaceous plants are actually non-native. So that's a lot of the agricultural weeds that are thriving in um, continuously disturbed soil fall into that um, criteria. Um, we can also see that almost half of our vines are not native and a relatively large proportion of um, perennial herbaceous plants are not native too. So those are different ways of how one can um, analyze the plants all together uh, to get an overview. Um, but now I would like to start, well, where do we start <laughs> introducing you to some of the plants that are actually out there? Um, so if you want to get familiar with some of the species, their sheer number can easily feel a little overwhelming. And so one way to try to approach this is to look at bite-sized groups of plants that have certain similarities that make them recognizable as a unit that's different from all other green things out there. And once you know that a plant belongs to a certain group, you have now narrowed down the possibilities and have a much better chance at identifying it. Luckily, botanists have done that grouping for us by defining plant families. Initially, plants were grouped into families based on similarities in their morphology, mostly of flowers, fruits, and leaves. Later, these families were often corrobated and sometimes modified based on chemical and genetic studies. So, but before we delve into some of these families that I promised I'm gonna introduce you to, um, let's learn or review some useful basic botanical concepts. So you might remember back in fifth grade, um, looking at a tulip flower and learning the different parts. So let's just review what the components of a complete flower are. So a complete flower has four basic components. The sepals, are modified leaves that are on the outside of the flower and protect the flower when it's still in bud. Petals are usually the colored um, leaves of a flower that serve to advertise the flower to the pollinators. The stamens, this, that, that ring of yellow things here, um, produce pollen. And then the pistil at the very center of the flower um, has an ovary that is designed to produce seeds if it gets pollinated. Flower, different flower species differ in the number of flower parts they have. For example, there are three parted flowers that have three sepals, three petals, three or six or nine or 12 sepals. There are four parted flowers where you have all the flower parts coming in fours. There are five parted flowers and there are even flowers that have more than five parts. Now another concept is that not all flowers are those nice uh, typical regular flowers that you would draw when you're asked to draw a flower. Um, we distinguish two main types of flowers, the regular flowers 
and the irregular flowers. Both of them can be complete, meaning that they have all four components of a flower. But in a regular flower, the components are arranged in a radially symmetrical shape, which means that the flower parts are arranged around a center, the pistil, like the spokes of a wheel. So there's the center and there are the spokes of a wheel. The petals are all similar in size, shape, and color. And you can turn that flower around whichever way you want. There's no upside or downside. It always looks basically the same. And the majority of our flowers are regular flowers. For example, lilies, roses, buttercups, and asters. Now, irregular flowers become a little bit more interesting. They still have petals, the sepals on the outside, the petals, the stamens, the pistil. But now that these flower parts are arranged in a bilaterally symmetrical way. So they're basically divisible into symmetrical halves on either side of a unique plane. So you could make a cut through here and oops, too fast. And both sides of that, of that plane look basically identical. The petals are not all similar in size, shape, and color. Sometimes you have a huge petal flagging where the flower is um, on the upside. Sometimes you have a big petal on the lower side that serves as a landing um, base for insects. And if you turn that flower around, it's going to look upside down. A, an irregular flower has a clear upside and downside, and you can't just turn it. Typical irregular flowers include violets, orchids, mints, and pea flowers. Now, <laughs> another concept is that not all flowers are complete flowers. Not all flowers have the sepals, petals, stamens, and pistil, like our nice, regular, complete flower example here. For example, grass flowers are basically reduced to the absolute minimum. They have their pistil here in the center with the two stigmas trying to catch pollen. And they have three stamens sticking out, and that's it. No petals, no sepals. And this, uh, this modified leaf here is called a lemma that sort of serves a little bit like, like a petal. But it's a, a very, very incomplete flower. And there are other examples. A lot of trees have also incomplete flowers. Incomplete flowers often happen when a plant has decided not to use insects as pollinators, but it's going to wind pollination, and so it can do away with the showy petals. Um, and then the last concept that I want to make you aware of with flowers, with regard to flowers, is there are perfect and imperfect flowers. So again, our little, our little drawing here shows a regular, complete, and perfect flower. It has the four um, components, which makes it a complete flower. And it's also a perfect flower because it has both the pistil and the stamen. The pistil is considered the female part of the flower, and the stamens are considered the male part of the flower. And therefore, a perfect flower that has both petals and, I'm sorry, that has both the pistil and the stamens is called a unisexual flower. Now, perfect flowers can be complete or incomplete, but they always have the pistil and the stamen. They might not have petals, they might not have sepals, but stamen and pistil both have to be there in order for it to be a perfect flower. Now, the opposite of a perfect flower is an imperfect flower. And the imperfect flower has either stamens or a pistil. So they are either female flowers or male flowers. For example, here, red maple has female flowers that only have pistils. They don't produce any pollen. And they have male flowers, um, which make only the stamens with the pollen, but 
I have no pistil and cannot make seeds. Only the female flowers can actually uh, produce fruits with the seeds in them. And all imperfect flowers are by definition incomplete because they're either missing the pistil or they're missing the stamen. So they never have all four parts. So they're always incomplete. So now I hope I, <laughs> I have not confused you too badly. Um, but those are some of the terms that are used um, describing different flowers. And, and it really helps seeing those patterns out in nature and inspecting flowers and trying to find the different parts and figuring out if they're uh, complete or incomplete flowers or perfect or imperfect. And we will see some of these examples. Now, other than the flowers, um, it also helps to pay attention to the way the leaves are arranged on the plant. The leaves can either be basal leaves, so they only come out of the, the base of the plant, but the rest of the stalk has no leaves. The leaves can be alternate, so they come out of the stalk one by one by one by one by one. <clears throat> or they can be opposite, which means they come out in pairs. One and one and one. <laughs> And finally, they can be whorled, so you have multiple leaves coming out of the same node at, uh, along the, the stalk of the plant. So those are terms um, describing the arrangement of the leaves on the plant, and then the shape of the leaves themselves um, is also very important in describing and distinguishing different plants. There we have two large groups. We have the so-called divided leaves, which can be pinnately divided, like a feather with a central axis and then the, the leaflets coming off on, out on the side. They can be palmately divided, like a hand with the fingers sticking out. <laughs> they can be trifoliate. Uh -oh, we don't want to do this. Um, a divided leaf can be trifoliate with three leaflets, or you can have a finely divided leaf that multiple, has multiple divisions. And then there is a large group of, of possibilities for undivided leaves. And with undivided leaves, then one describes, OK, so wh what does the margin of the leaf look like? It can be entire, so it's smooth. It can be toothed, or it can be a lobed leaf. So those are um, all terms that are used to describe the shape of the leaf itself. And with that, we're at the end of that introduction of botanical terms. And when you look in any field guide or uh, a key to identifying plants, those terms will sure um, start showing up. You will have irregular flowers. You will have regular flowers. They will ask you how many parts the regular flower has. Um, there will be asked questions about the, the leaves. And don't feel intimidated if you think you might not remember all this, because usually the field guides have a glossary or have even illustrations to explain those different um, terms. In fact, um, these, these leaf terms were taken right off, out of the Newcomb's um, wildflower guide. So just leaf around in that book and you will, you will usually find explanations of what all those terms mean. But I just wanted to sort of introduce you to some of the ways people look at plants and what to look for when trying to distinguish them. Now let's start with the fun part. Um, so I chose five plant families for this presentation um, because they were all um, prominent in the last few weeks when one looked at the flowering plants out there in the spring. And the first one is the lily family. And I'm defining the lily family broadly here. Uh, the tax taxonomy of the, the plants in that group has been a little bit topsy-turfy and there's a lot of recent changes. And I'm just going to go with the good old-fashioned larger group of um, grouping for for plants that could be called lilies in the large sense. Um, all of those have leaves that are undivided with entire margins. 
so no, no toothed leaves in the lily family. The leaves almost always have parallel veins. You can see it here. The, the veins are all parallel along the leaf blade. Um, with one exception, trillium is sort of an intermediate leaf venation. The leaves are either basal, whorled, or alternate. I have never seen a lily that actually has opposite leaves. The flowers are regular and perfect. <clears throat> so they are, you know, central axis, the petals arranged like the spokes of a wheel around them. They're perfect. They have the stamens and the pistil in the same flower. Um, and almost always they are, have either three or six petals or tepals because um, in this group, the petals and the sepals often look very much alike, and then they're called tepals. And the one big exception is Canada Mayflower, which has four flower parts. Don't ask me why, it just decided not to play by the rules. The fruit usually is either a three-parted capsule, like this, or it's a three to multiple seeded berry. All our species in that group are perennial herbaceous plants. We no have no lily trees. <laughs> um, and all of them have bulbs, tubers, or rhizomes. That's why a lot of the, the plants in that group are early spring flowering, because they have nice storage organs in the ground, and they're ready to, to go um, early in the spring. Some of them are edible, but at least one of them is deadly poisonous. <clears throat> so that's the, the description of the whole group. And now I will introduce you to individual species that we have here. First one is the trout lily. So trout lily is yeah, one, of, one of the first spring flowers that comes out every year. Um, it grows often in large colonies of single-leafed plants that never actually make any flowers. And all these little plants are connected underground with rhizome, and sometimes you can see these white worm-like things coming on, out on the surface of the ground. And that indicates that there is a colony of trout lily living there. So even later in the summer, when the leaves have wilted, um, you might see those wiry things sticking out and you know, oh, this is where trout lily colony lives. Trout lily is often found along streams or in moist areas of the forest. And some of the plants develop two leaves and only two-leafed plants make flowers. And the flowers are your really nice, typical six tepals, six um, stamens, and then the pistil in the center, which will eventually develop into a three-parted um, capsule, which you can see right here. So that is the trout lily. And trout lily is one of our true spring ephemerals. It comes out early and it disappears quickly. So right now, this picture was taken just a couple of weeks ago. Um, the leaves are already wilting, and in a month, you will not see any of the trout lily leaves anymore. And the thing that I forgot to mention is that when they first come out, they are nicely mottled. Some people say it's that's where this lily got its name from, trout lily, because it looks a little bit like a rainbow trout. Other people say it's called trout lily because it starts flowering when the trout fishing season starts. Canada lily is not flowering yet, but will soon. June is its time. Um, that is an, a larger plant that grows uh, with individual plants, not in colonies. And again, it has this nice, typical lily flower, um, often several on, ones, on one plant that are dangling, pointing downward. The leaves are whorled. <coughs> and the, the fruit that develops is a three-parted capsule, and it actually turns upright when it's, um, when it's ripe. 
The habitat of Canada lily is both floodplain forests. One beautiful place to find them in our county is in the Lewis Swire Preserve, the boardwalk that goes through a freshwater tidal swamp forest. And there you can see the, the Canada lilies flowering mid to end June. Uh, another place where we sometimes find them is old fields, moist old fields. One problem that the Canada lily and some other lilies have is the scarlet lily beetle, a beautiful bright red little beetle um, that unfortunately got introduced and um, loves to eat native and garden lilies alike. <clears throat> the wood lily closely Closely related to Canada lily, um, has a different gesture. Its flowers actually are upside up, cup shaped. Um, it also has the world leaves. The habitat is a little bit different. It's, it's more found in drier areas. We usually see it more in the eastern part of the county, um, like at steepletop in the old uh, blueberry fields there, or sometimes suddenly you stumble upon one in the forest in the Taconic State Park. It's not a common plant at all, and it makes that very similar three-parted capsule um, as its fruit. They also flower later. Um, they have not flowered yet. They will flower in June. <clears throat> Next are the bellworts, which you might have seen. Again, early spring flowering plants. Um, we have three species of them. One is called the perfoliate bellwort um, because it looks as if the stalk is actually um, growing right through the leaf or the leaf is growing around the stalk. Bellworts are, <clears throat> when, when they flower, when, when they're large enough to flower, the plants are always branched. So um, there's one... one um, twig of it <laughs> and there's the other one and this is where the flower was. They have only one bell-shaped flower and that develops into a three-parted capsule and that makes it different from the Solomon seals which it otherwise looks very similar to. Here's the sessel leafed bellwort, um, similar principle as the perfoliate leaf but the leaves are sessile on the stock and not um, growing around it. And then there's another species, the large flowered bellwort, um, which I'm not sure I have ever seen, but it shows up on the lists and it supposedly um, likes really rich forest areas. <clears throat> another one that's a little bit similar to the Solomon seal, um, but it's not Solomon's seal because it's also branched. Here you can see another branched plant. This one is called twisted stalk. And the more common one of the two species is the rosy twisted stalk, <coughs> which has a hairy stem and its leaves are sessile on, on the stalk. There is supposedly, and again, I have never seen that plant, a clasping leafed twisted stalk, which is not hairy and where the leaves would actually clasp the stem a little bit, like in the perfoliate bellwort. Now, the rosy twisted stalk has several bell-shaped flowers, one in each uh, leaf axle, very similar to, to the Solomon's seal. Again, this is not this is not a common plant. Uh, again, we usually see it in the eastern part of the county, like at Bash Bish, uh, up in New Lebanon. We came across across one at some point. <clears throat> and now the, comes the Solomon seal, which is much more common. Supposedly, we have two species here. Um, both of them have these dangling flowers underneath the. The leaves, the leaves are alternate coming out of the unbranched stalk and they will turn into dark berries, not those um, three-parted capsules of the bellwort. And I think that the more common one that we have here is the hairy Solomon seal, although it's not often very hairy. And then the so-called King Solomon seal um, 
is, I think, a much sturdier plant that I see sometimes closer to the Hudson. Um, but I'm not 100% sure with the, with the distinction of those two. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's some hybridization happening as well. And then come the myanthemum species. Oops. Um, one of them is Canada Mayflower, which is in bloom right now. Very similar to the trout lily, it makes these colonies of one-leafed plants. And only um, when the plant is strong enough to produce two leaves, it also produces its flowers. And um, the flowers are at the, the tip of the branch, small. As I said, they are four-parted, not six-parted like in, in all other um, members of the lily family, and they will develop into little red berries. And then closely related to the Canada Mayflower are the Solomon seals. Um, the I'm sorry, the false Solomon seals. <clears throat> we have two species of false Solomon seals here, the regular false Solomon seal and the starry false Solomon seal. The regular false Solomon seal is the one that you are most most likely familiar with. So it looks like the Solomon seal in the forest, but um, it has its flowers at the tip of the branch in a, in a branched inflorescence. And then um, that develops into red berries. And this is a relatively common plant in upland forests. The star starry false Solomon seal is a much rarer plant um, that seems to be limited to wetlands swamp forests, and it has a smaller inflorescence that's not branched, um, and it also develops little red berries. And then there comes the false hellebore, which is not really a spring flower per se, although its shoots come out very early in the spring, and they're super characteristic with this ribbing. Um, and then Pretty soon the leaves unfold, and it's a rather large plant. They can be a foot or two tall, um, these leaves that are nicely alternate arranged. And then later in the season, like now, they're starting to make buds, and then sometime in June, the flowers come out. And this is a very, very poisonous plant um, that has a chemical that acts on the heart and has actually been used in medicines that control blood pressure. But um, eating, eating a false hellebore can actually kill a person and it can kill a sheep or a cow. So this is not one to, to um, joke with. And there are two plants that sometimes are confused with the false hellebore. Sometimes people confuse skunk cabbage, which we're going to talk about later. Um, with the false hellebore. Both of them are sort of big green leafed things that come out early in the spring. But look at the parallel venation of the false hellebore that identifies it clearly as a member of the lily family, while the skunk cabbage has pinnate venation, central, central vein and then side veins coming off. So much more like cabbage, although it's not in the cabbage family. Um, and then sometimes at this stage, people also confuse false hellebore with ramps, which can be really dangerous because ramps sometimes gets foraged, um, collected to actually be eaten, and you do not want to eat the false hellebore. So you really want to want to be sure you know um, your ramps before you start collecting them. All right. What else do we have? The trilliums. It wouldn't be complete without the trilliums, another beautiful group of um, spring flowers that we have here. We have found so far three wild-growing species in Columbia County. We have the red trillium, which is the most common one, which sometimes actually occurs as a white form. Um, and then we have painted trillium, which is a little bit less common, more in the eastern part of the county. And then we have nodding trillium, which we only know from um, 
the area at Art Omai. There are a few plants there, um, white flowers that dangle underneath the leaves, so they don't they don't sit on top of the leaves like in in painted trillium, but they they dangle. And with trilliums, well, everything is in threes. The leaves are in threes. One, two, three. The sepals are in threes. The petals are in threes. And then I guess the, the stamens are in sixes. Um, and then the pistil has a three-parted stigma. The pistil will develop into a fleshy capsule that has these little seeds in it. So that's what the fruit of... Um, Trillium looks like. Now, trillium is sometimes confused with Jack in the pulpit when it's not flowering. Young, young leaves of trillium and Jack in the pulpit can sometimes look awfully similar. And I made some a little drawing here trying to show how to distinguish them. So ideally, Jack in the pulpit, the three leaflets are more arranged in a T shape. And there is a clear asymmetry, um, or let's say there is one, <laughs> one plane where um, both sides are symmetrical, but not each of the leaf leaflets looks the same. And the venation of Jack in the pulpit is clearly a pinnate venation. Again, that term um, that indicates that you have a central vein and then you have side veins coming off it. Trillium, on the other hand, is a much more spokes of the wheel type of arrangement of the leaves, or the leaflets. Um, no, actually, they are leaves in trillium, I'm sorry. Three leaves. And they have somewhat, <laughs> they have somewhat of a parallel venation. So there are, there's a central vein, but then there are two side veins also um, going up the leaf. But then you also have a little bit of um, connecting veins between those parallel veins. They are at a steeper angle. Um, the, the connecting veins are at a steeper angle than the side veins in Jack and the Pulpit leaves. So maybe that will help you next time when you come across one of those three leaf things in the forest and you go like, huh, is it Trillium or is it Jack in the Pulpit? Um, all right. And then um, ramps or wild leek also belongs to the lily family in the broad sense. Um, yeah, you probably are all familiar with them. This is how they come out of their little bulbs early, early in the spring. Usually they grow in floodplains or in deep soils um, in, the, in the forest. And then they make their they unfold their leaves. Sometimes in a colony, you can see the old fruiting um, infl infructescence from last year still sitting around. This is what it looks like, blackberries. So these were, um, were formed the fall prior to the, to the young leaves coming out. And then what happens is if they don't get harvested, they will wilt. And then the flowers come out. So you will never see a ramp flowering while the leaves are still green and happy. The leaves wilt, power gets pulled back into the bulb, and then a second push happens and the flowers get produced. This is the flower of ramp. And this flower then, whoops, um, builds or develops into these black seeds that then stick up out of the, the ground for the rest of the season through the winter. Sometimes you can see them with snow on them. And then the next spring, the leaves start coming out again around them. Um, a word about foraging for ramps. Um, it's, we think it's really, really important that you only do that in places where you have control over how much gets taken and don't harvest them in areas that are open for all because even if you take only a small amount, the next person comes and takes a small amount, the next person comes and takes a small amount and soon enough the population can be decimated 
Um, so it's really important to find somebody who has a nice patch who allows you to come and harvest, um, but don't harvest it in public areas because a lot of colonies of ramps have been decimated by everybody taking just a few of them. And also, only harvest the leaves. Don't pull the bulbs out because a ramp plant from seed to flowering takes seven years. So it's it's a long, long process for them to become mature. And if you pull out the bulb, you interrupt that, that cycle. Now there are two um, other onion-like um, plants, the wild garlic, which is also called onion grass, and wild onion, which uh, the wild onion is a native one, the wild garlic is an introduced one. And the big difference between those two is that the leaves of wild garlic are round in cross-section, and those of wild onion of the native one are sideways flattened. And then the last few members in the lily family that I just quickly want to mention is blue bead lily, not a common plant uh, in Columbia County, only found in the higher elevations on the east. Um, and as the name says, the, the fruits are going to be blue berries. And then cucumber root is a little bit more common than blue bead lily, more widespread and dryish forests has this unique, um, well, not unique, but almost unique arrangement of world leaves um, in two layers, and then the little flowers dangle underneath the upper leaf layer. Um, and when you look closer at the flowers, they're really beautiful, delicate little, little things. All right. Our next family is the mustard family. Now that is a nice compact family where everybody plays by the rules and the similarity between the plants is really quite um, consistent and, and very satisfying. <laughs> so the leaves are always alternate and or in a basal rosette. Many of the members of the mustard family have basal rosettes as well as the leaves going up the stalk to the flowers. The leaves are often divided. Leaf margins can be variable. The flowers, however, are almost regular and always perfect. So they always have pistil and, and stamens. And they always have four petals and six stamens. So there's a little bit of, a, of an off thing in there. Um, that the, the stamens are not the same number as the petals or double the petals, but it's six. That's why they're almost regular and not perfectly regular. Um, the fruit is a so-called silique, which is a dry elongated capsule that separates at maturity into two segments, leaving a persistent partition that bears the seeds. So the, the fruit, here it would be attached, nope here it would be attached to the plant and then this is the partition that stays in the center that bears the seeds and these are the two halves of the capsule that the two segments that open up and that's the basic model <clears throat> that comes in a variety of shapes and sizes but um, it's always there in the members of the mustard family. They are perennial or annual herbaceous plants. Again, we do not have any trees in the mustard family. And they include many cultivated crops like mustard, like um, canola, like horseradish, like cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, um, you name it. It also includes a lot of agricultural weeds and there are some native species and some of our worst invasives are also members of the mustard family. So a lot to, to get to know there. Um, this family includes a lot of edible species and I do not know of any poison, poisonous um, species in that family. So the first one you're probably all familiar with is the garlic mustard, an introduced very, very invasive species. And I was probably intentionally brought here by early settlers because these basal rosettes 
um, of this biennial plant. These are the first year um, plants that overwinter, the rosettes. And they are one of the first green plants in the spring and they're totally edible and so um, people like to have them around as pot herbs. The little seedlings <coughs> that, that actually grow from the seeds um, are also visible early in the spring. So these will grow during their first year into this. They will stay over winter like that and then the second year they'll shoot up and produce the flowers which are nice four petals, six stamens, one pistil that develops into the silic. Here's that long, narrow silic, which eventually will split open with two <coughs> segments, and um, you have to partition in the center with the seeds on it. So that's the garlic mustard, and it can, it can especially flood plains, rich forest areas. It can really create monocultures and exclude um, native plants from the area. <coughs> um, often sharing the habitat with garlic mustard is Dame's Rocket, another member of the mustard family. <coughs> Alternate leaves going up the stem, basil rosette, again a biennial, has the same, the same life cycle, the four petals can cover large, large areas, flood plains, along ditches of roads, wet meadows, moist meadows. Um, that's Dame's Rocket. And Dame's Rocket is very often confused with Phlox. Many people call Dame's Rocket Phlox, but Phlox is actually a different species and a different family. It has five petals, the Phlox, and it has opposite leaves while the dame's rocket has four petals and alternate leaves. So once, once you know what to look for, they're really to easy to distinguish. But superficially, they look very similar. Same, same color, ranging from, from white to pink to purple. Um, actually, dame's rocket flowers a little bit earlier than phlox, and those large patches are always dame's, rock, dame's rocket. I've never seen phlox grow in a large patch like that. It's a much more modest plant where you can see one or two sometimes, but, but not these big masses. <coughs> Wintercress is another early flowering uh, member of the mustard family. Um, again, it overwinters in this rosette and then shoots up and makes its flowers in April. And you can still see them flowering um, now. And the classical mustard, mustard flower. And then we come to the native ones. Did I skip one? No, sorry. The native, so all three, um, garlic mustard, dame's rocket, and wintergrass are uh, introduced from Europe. Wintercress is not considered invasive because it doesn't go into native habitats, but uh, dame's rocket and garlic mustard are. The toothworts are native species. There are three different ones. I know two of them very well, the cut-leafed toothwort and the broad-leafed toothwort. Here you can see the two leaves side by side, um, self-explanatory, broad-leaf and cut-leaf. And again, they have the typical four-petaled flowers. They're true spring ephemerals in that at this time, by, by the time June comes around, the leaves are wilting and um, a month later you will not see anything from, from those plants anymore until next April. And why they are interesting is um, there is a rare native butterfly that's called the West Virginia White that lays its eggs on these toothworts. And um, there is a suspicion that this butterfly has become rare in part because of the introduction of garlic mustard, because the butterfly thinks that garlic mustard uh, works as a host plant for its caterpillars and lays its eggs on it. But the caterpillars can actually not develop into butterflies by feeding on garlic mustard. And so it's an ecological trap they do need the toothworts. 
And um, we regularly see the West Virginia white in areas where there's a lot of toothwort, like at Hand Hollow, um, around Shaker Swamp. <clears throat> Another member of the mustard family that's um, early spring flowering is the smooth rock cress. It's a really hard one to take a good picture of. <laughs> it's a relatively tall plant. It can be a, a couple of feet tall and um, has this dangly inflorescence. Very, very smooth, the whole plant, and clasping leaves. This bad picture is trying to show the clasping leaves. Um, that's also a native member of the, the mustard family that many people see in the spring and don't know what the heck it is. Um, it often grows on rocks or on thin soils. And then um, we have some early flowering introduced species. Um, I wanted to say these, no, <laughs> these are not all annuals. They are also biennials. Shepherd's purse has this rosette that um, then develops into a flowering stalk. Field penny crest, the rosettes, you can sometimes see green all through the winter. Um, these are all, all three species of disturbed areas, um, agricultural weeds. So shepherd's purse with the, with the nice triangular um, silic <clears throat> tower mustard, which looks very similar to the smooth rock, rock cress. It's also one of those really tall, narrow, dangly um, plants, smooth with clasping leaves. <coughs> but the flowers are denser, arranged um, more dense in, the infloresc in inflorescence, and the habitat is totally different. You would never see the smooth rock cress in an agricultural field and I have never seen a tower mustard growing on a rock. Field mustard is basically the closest wild relative to all our cabbages. Um, also agricultural wheat and, as I said, field penny cress, which will develop siliques that look, they're flat and round and look a little bit like pennies. That's where the name comes from. And then I want to... Um, introduce you to a newcomer to the county, which is probably going to become our next invasive plant. It's called narrow-leafed bittercress. It comes from Europe. Um, and it has these, yeah, interestingly shaped, narrow-toothed leaflets and these whitish flowers. And it's I see it along old rail beds and in some areas like around Drownland Swamp um, on the, the trail that goes down along the, the flood, uh, along the swamp forest. There's a lot of the narrow-leafed bittercress in there already. So when you see a few plants somewhere, rip them out because it might slow down its spread. The next family is the buttercup family. Again, I find that one of the very satisfying families because it holds together pretty well. Most members play by the rules quite well. Um, the leaves are almost always alternate or in basal rosettes. <coughs> one, one big ex exception is Clematis, the virgin's bower, which has opposite leaves. The leaves are often deeply lobed or divided. Leaf margins can be variable. Most flowers are regular, and almost always they are perfect. The exception of the perfect flowers is early meadow rue, which has male and female flowers on different plants, as well as the clematis species, which also have uh, male and female flowers on different plants. The flowers are not always complete. Sometimes petals are missing and sepals um, become colorful like the petals. The flower parts can be five or more, and sometimes they are variable within species, which is kind of interesting um, that there can be variation from five to ten petals in, um, for example, the hepaticas. And sometimes, as I said, what looks like petals are actually colored sepals. 
The flowers typically, typically have many stamens. So this marsh marigold uh, shows the many, many, many stamens. And multiple pistils. So it doesn't have just one pistil in the center, but several of them. And then each of those pistils develops either into an akin, which is a one-seeded dry fruit that does not pop open, or a follicle, which is a multiple-seeded dehiscent dry fruit. So this is an example of follicles of the columbine. So each of these fruits has several seeds in it, and they will split open and release the seeds when they are ripe. <coughs> Sometimes the fruit is a berry, very rarely. None of the, the members of the buttercup family are edible raw. They all are poisonous when they are raw. Many of them are medicinal. Many, many are actually pretty poisonous. And some of them supposedly can be eaten if you boil them and throw out the water, but I would not mess with them. <coughs> um, here's our first... Um, set of lookalikes. <laughs> the native marsh marigold, <clears throat> perfectly nice flower, loves um, swamp forests, flowers very early in the season, has these nice five-petaled um, flowers with multiple stamens and several pistils, and then the pistils develop into um, follicles. And then, unfortunately, there is a look-alike. Again, it's one of those new invasive species that's not very common around here yet. But where it grows, it grows fast and furious. And it has capacity to really um, dominate the scene, mostly in floodplain forests or along ditches. This one is called the Lesser Celandine. And it comes from Europe. Its flowers have more than five petals. The petals are narrower. And <clears throat> it has these tubers that even if you rip out the plants, often the tubers break off and then next year another plant is right there growing out of the tubers. So when you try to eradicate them from an area, dig them up very, very carefully and make sure to collect all the tubers. Um, we spent a couple of days this spring in the floodplain forest at the Hawthorne Valley trying to get on top of those guys that have been starting to spread. <coughs> um, hepaticas and anemones are beloved spring flowers in our area. We have two types of hepatica, the blunt-lobed or round-lobed, which is Hepatica americana, and the sharp lobed, which is Acutiloba. Um, I'm not quite sure. I think the flowers are pretty much identical, the differences in the leaves. And this might have been a sharp lobed because it sort of has a point here, but the leaf is pretty beaten up and it might also just be an, an artifact. So I'm not quite sure which of the two this one is. But um, they have sepals, petals. Petal number um, is a little bit variable. They supposedly do not produce any nectar, nor does the rue anemone, and according to many sources, nor does the wood anemone, although I have found one source saying that uh, with the wood anemone, it's actually not true that it does produce nectar as well. But all of them definitely produce pollen and are readily visited by pollinators in the spring solitary bees who are collecting pollen to supply their nests. Um, the hepaticas have wintergreen leaves, so you can find their leaves under the snow. And then in the spring, the flower comes up, the old leaf withers, and new leaves form. Rue anemone and wood anemone have no above-ground parts overwintering. They start every year um, fresh. And the big difference between these two is obviously in the leaves, with the rue having these rounded, lobed leaves. The rue anemone and the wood anemone has toothed, more pointed leaves. <coughs> meadow rues, we have two different species. The early meadow rue 
It's called Salictrum dioicum because it's a dioecious species, which means there are female and male plants. So all these little flowers here have nothing but stamens, and all these little flowers have nothing but pistils. Um, and this is um, a plant that starts early and grows usually near rocks. And then the tall meadow rue um, actually has perfect flowers. So it has male and female parts in each of the flower flowers. And it's a much taller, more robust plant that grows usually near rivers or in wet meadows and comes out later um, and flowers in June. And then wild columbine belongs to the buttercup family too. So that one became a little bit creative with its flower. It's a regular flower. It's a perfect flower, but it sure has some, some special features. It has like these deep, deep, deep tubes where the, the nectar is um, provided at the very, very tip. So only very long tongued pollinators or of course the hummingbirds come and, and reach into those um, tubes to get the nectar. And then as I had shown already, um, the fruits are follicles that then pop open and reveal their shiny black seeds. And columbines are also real, real artists in terms of where they grow. They're usually sitting right on rocks. Um, very nice plant. And then there is another columbine that sometimes pops up in gardens or along roadsides. Um, if it doesn't have this combination of red and yellow in the flower, um, then it's the European columbine, which can be white or blue or purple. Um, yeah, I like them too, but they're not native here. And then uh, a little bit of a little bit of different model of um, the buttercup family are the bane berries, which actually produce berries instead of achenes or follicles. Um, they also have these multiple times divided leaves, toothed margins, both of them, um, and the flowers are white, perfect um, in the white baneberry, which is also called doll's eyes. The flowers are more closely clustered and the inflorescence is more conical or just more elongated. And in the red baneberry, they're not as closely clust tightly clustered and the inflorescence tends to be a little bit flatter. And then of course the red baneberry makes red berries and the white baneberry makes white berries, and they're called doll's eyes because of that dark dot that looks like a pupil. Um, and then there's a third one uh, in the genus Actaea, which is the black cohosh, which we have never seen in Columbia County, but supposedly at least it did occur here, and it might still be hiding out some, some places. And then finally, there's the virgin's bower. So that's a vine in the um, buttercup family. And this one is unusual in two respects. It has opposite leaves. The only member of the buttercup family that I know of that has opposite leaves. And they are trifoliate, so they have three leaflets, each leaf. And the flowers are imperfect flowers with the female flowers having the pistils and some rudimentary stamens. They're not functional, they don't produce pollen. And then the male flowers with the actual stamens. And then the female flowers develop into these nice fuzzy um, seed heads with the follicles um, with their hairs attached to fly off. And then there's a very rare, so this, the, the virgin sparrow is, is a common plant in wetlands, open wetlands. Um, and then there is a rare cousin, the purple virgin sparrow. Again, I have never seen it. Um, it used to be around. I, I don't know if it still is in the county. 
And then the actual buttercups of the buttercup family, we have 16 species of true buttercups. And most of them are native. There are only three that are not native. And the one that, that flowers first of the year is usually the kidney-leafed or small flowered buttercup. Look at that cute little flower. The petals are teeny, teeny, tiny. So there are petals here, but they're very, very small. They're basically as long or even shorter than the sepals. But then you have the, the nice um, multiple pistils that turn into akins. Um, it has a basal rosette that overwinters. No, it does not overwinter. I don't think it overwinters, actually. I'm sorry. Um, it comes out early in the spring, and sometimes it sort of looks a little bit like a violet or maybe garlic mustard, but um, the leaves are a little bit tougher and a little bit smoother than, than violets or garlic mustard. And then when the flowering stalk develops, the leaves uh, higher up have a completely different shape. You can see they're narrow and toothed. So there's quite a, quite a variation in leaf shape in the kidney-leafed buttercup. Another native buttercup with very um, small flowers. Look, there are the petals, tiny, tiny petals, much shorter than the sepals. Um, this one is the hooked buttercup. It's also a native one of our woodlands. It grows tall, like knee-high. The leaves are a little bit pubescent. Um, and always have this, this kind of shape, which is more lobed than actually divided. Um, and then there is the woodland buttercup, which is always a very small plant, close to the ground, also flowers very, very early in the season. That one has, has nice large petals, looks more like a buttercup as you're used to. And it also has hairy leaves. And then the swamp buttercup, grows in swamps, has very pointy um, toothed leaves, is very hairy, look at that hairy stem, and, and also can grow knee high um, in swampy areas. So those are some of the, the native buttercups. And then here are two examples of the introduced European buttercups that are mostly meadow species that are also flowering early in the season. We've, we've seen them come into flower like in mid-May. Um, there's the bulbous buttercup and the tall buttercup. And one can actually distinguish them, although they look very, very similar. The bulbous buttercup, can you see how the sepals are sort of bent down below the, the petals? That's very characteristic of the bulbous buttercup, while the tall buttercup, the, the sepals are um, upright attached, or not attached, but right adjacent to the, to the petals. The other difference, even if you don't have the flowers, you can distinguish those two species um, by their leaves. The tall buttercup has a palmately lobed leaf, and the bulbous buttercup has, has actually a divided leaf where the central leaflet has a little stalk here. So actually, I think I made, yes, I made little circles um, where the, the differences are. So that little stalk could never be a tall buttercup because the middle leaflet in a tall buttercup does not have a stalk. All right. On to our second to last family, the arum family. So that's a mostly tropical family. Your philodendron and your flower pot belongs into that family. Um, they have a very unique flower arrangement with tiny flowers at the base of a fleshy column that's called the spadix, like this one here is the spadix, and right there at the base are the little flowers. And the spadix is often hooded or flagged by a bract that's called a spathe. So no petals and no sepals on those flowers, but they have the spadix and the spathe. The flowers are regular, they're incomplete, as I said, no petals, no, no sepals. And in some species, they are bisexual, and others, they are male and female flowers separate. Some of these plants are medicinal, like sweet flag, but some are also pretty poisonous, like jack in the pulpit and skunk cabbage. So let's start with skunk cabbage, with, with, which is a favorite of a lot of people. 
skunk cabbage actually, the shoots of skunk cabbage sometimes develop late in fall and are actually above ground in the winter. You can find them in the snow. But then in the spring, they quickly develop their space with the spadix inside and the little flowers attached to the spadix. And then pretty soon after the flower comes out, the big cabbage-like leaves develop as well. And they can cover whole swampy areas like this um, with their, their leaves. And when you look closer at the flowers, <coughs> skunk cabbage has either male or female. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> skunk cabbage is actually male and female in the same flower, but successively. So first they're female. This is the female stage of the skunk cabbage flower. And this is actually one flower. The petals and sepals have sort of fused to fleshy somethings that surround the pistil. Let's see, there's the pistil. Um, and the, the plant first goes through this phase of being receptive for pollen coming from another plant. And then when they have been pollinated, whoa, when they, the flowers have been pollinated, then the stamens develop and the, the plant becomes um, functionally male. And then the seeds develop into this really <laughs> ugly looking fruit that reminds of some medieval weapon, um, which eventually breaks open and you can see the seeds inside there. And the seeds are eaten by um, partridges and grouse. Um, a lot of birds eat those seeds. And one interesting thing too is at this stage, early in the spring, the skunk cabbage um, space actually produces heat and provides like a, a little oven, a little warm-up station for early flying pollinators. Jack in the pulpit, you're probably all familiar with that beauty. That one has a slightly different situation um, with the flowers. Um, in Jack in the pulpit, the flowers are one year either male or female. The interesting thing is that the same plant growing out of the same corm underneath the ground, the next year, can change sex. So if the plant has become stronger, if it was a male one year and it has been able to photosynthesize a lot and to collect a lot of um, reserves, the next year it might decide to, to make female flowers and to produce fruits. This is the, the fruits of Jack in the pulpit developing while the space is already wilting, the leaves are already wilting away, the fruits develop, and these fruits also get devoured by a lot of birds. This was a road-killed grouse that we found, I think it was in Bibi State Forest. And Conrad picked it up and cut open the um, gizzard to see what it had been eating, and it was filled with Jack in the pulpit fruits. And you can imagine that if a fruit like that um, falls over and the, the little seedlings develop out of the seeds, you get clusters of like a kindergarten of young jack-in-the-pulpit plants. And people say that you can recognize, that you can predict um, if a jack-in-the-pulpit is in its male or female face by the number of leaves it has. Generally, the tendency is that the male plants have only one of these three-parted leaves, while the females produce two three-parted leaves. But um, I've tested that hypothesis, and it's not 100% foolproof. I have found a male that had two leaves. So. Green dragon is a little-known relative of Jack in the pulpit that's totally confined to floodplains in our area. It can grow very tall, hip high, has these super divided leaves. Um, and its, it's spadix is like this very narrow white colored um, structure. It's not very much covered by a spathus at all. 
Um, but doesn't that look like a philodendron and it grows in our backyard right here in floodplain forests? So that, that was an, an interesting one to learn about. And then here are some other examples um, of native plants in the Arum family. Sweet flag, I've already mentioned, a medicinal plant. Um, you can make tea out of the leaves and it calms uh, the stomach. It smells very good too when you crush the leaves. This one grows in marshes. Um, the wild calla, um, once in a while we see it in a floodplain forest. No, in a swamp forest. Um, it's not a very common plant at all. Golden club is actually stayed rare, only grows along the Hudson on tidal mud flats. And then the arrow arum is a little bit more common. Um, there are there are nice colonies, for example, at Drownland Swamp. Um, but yeah, these are these exotic looking, almost tropical looking plants that that actually do occur in Columbia County in the wild. And then I want to close with the violet family, another favorite group of spring flowers, relatively easily recognized as a group. A little bit trickier to actually distinguish the different species, but I hope I can show you a few tricks to, to help you nail down at least some of them. Um, in general, they have irregular but complete and perfect five-parted flowers. So male and female parts are there, petals are there, sepals are there, but they're irregular. The petals are not all the same. You have the, the landing pad with the little landing strips guiding the, the pollinators towards the, the nectar and the pollen, and then the, the, side, the side petals and the upper petals flagging the, advertising the, the flower. The leaves are often, but not always, heart-shaped. And then there's a trick that's good to know for violets. Um, there are some species that are coalescent. That means they have a stem, a stem out of which leaves grow and out of which at the top the flower grows. And then there are some other um, violet species that are acolescent. That means they only have basal leaves and the flowering stalk has, is naked. It does not have any leaves coming out of the, the stalk that bears the flower. And that's a, that's a good distinction um, to know of because then you can sort of separate the, the groups of species into two groups. Typically they, they flower in the spring but many species can actually flower again in the fall if they have not been pollinated and were not able to produce seeds. Um, also, a lot of them have a backup system of underground flowers that are, they, they never open. They can self-pollinate and produce seeds just under the ground and they're called cleistogamous flowers. And the fruit of violets is always a three-parted capsule that pops open and their seeds, as those of many other um, spring flowers, have little um, fatty appendices that are called iliosomes that um, are very attractive to ants. And so ants carry the seeds away, carry them close to their, um, to their nests, and with that disperse the, the violet seeds. We have 22 species of violas, plus one very rare plant, the green violet, uh, which belongs into a different genus, but in that same family. And I, again, have never seen that one, so I can't tell you much about that. But let's look at the, the violas, the actual violets, um, in a little bit more detail. So the one that you're probably most familiar with is the common blue violet. It's acolescent, not, not stemmed, each leaf Comes, comes out of the ground on its own. Each flower has a naked stalk. The leaves are nice heart-shaped. Um, and the flowers are usually a dark blue. They can be a little bit lighter blue. And very once in a while, you see a white one. So that's the common blue violet. And that's our common violet of um, upland forests, meadows, lawns. 
Um, you've certainly seen that one. Now, marsh violet is very similar to the common blue violet, also acolescent, um, also heart-shaped leaves, but the uh, flower stalks tend to be a little bit taller, so the flower stalks always um, stick up quite a bit above the, the leaves. Plus, marsh violet usually grows in really wet places, marshy areas, on little islands and streams, um, creek shores, that's where, where you see the marsh violet. So it likes wetter environments than the common blue violet. Now here is a couple of species that have not heart-shaped leaves, but they're also acolescent. The arrow-leafed violet has either oval leaves or almost like arrow-shaped leaves with little, little lobes at the base. Um, this tends to be in dry places and relatively low. Also blue flowers. And then the palmate-leafed violet has these very divided, um, often very different shaped leaves on the same plant. The earlier leaves are less divided and then the later leaves, the older leaves, um, no, actually the younger leaves that, that come out later are more divided. So very, very non-violet-like leaves, but um, it also has blue flowers that, that grow on stalks um, that don't have any leaves attached. They are acolescent. Now this is a pair of also blue violets, but these are coalescent. So these have a stalk with leaves coming out of the stalk and then at the top is the, the blue flower. And we have two species that follow this model. One is the dog violet and one is the long spurred violet. Both of them have a spur at the end of their flowers where the nectar is, is hidden. Um, only the long spurred violet has a really long, narrow spur. I mean, when, when you see those, you know which one you're looking at. And the dog violet has a spur, but it's a little bit shorter and more rounded. Um, the long spurred is the much less common of the two. It tends to be in areas that have a lot of calcium in the soil. Um, the dog violet is often in wettish areas, swamp forests. Um, yeah, so, so sometimes the habitat helps narrow down which species you're looking at. And then there are, there are two species of yellow flowering violets. One of them is coalescent. It has a stalk. That's our yellow forest violet. Very common, probably the second most common after the common blue violet. Um, and then there is an acolescent yellow flowering one that I very, very rarely see. I think it flowers super early, like late March. Um, it's called round-leafed violet. And yeah, it's a very small one that has just a few little roundish leaves and a few little short stalked flowers. <clears throat> and then there are a few white flowering violets. One of them is coalescent. That's the Canada violet. That's easily the tallest of our violets. Um, they can, yeah, they can almost be knee high, um, a nice patch like this. Um, very specific to calcium rich soils. So we don't have we don't have a lot of places where, where Canada violet grows. And the flowers are beautiful. They are white, but they have purple um, nectar guides. And the back side of the petals are actually purple. So there's a nice, nice variation there. And then we have a couple of species of acolescent white violets that are a little bit tricky to distinguish. Um, as I understand it, the sweet white violet is the more common one um, that grows in upland forests. And then the smooth white violet um, likes wetter areas. So it's around seeps, um, the shores of beaver ponds. But sometimes I, I see 
one of those acolescent white violets, and I'm not 100% sure. Supposedly, there's also a difference in the leaf shape. I believe the sweet white violet um, has supposedly more pointed leaf tips, but look how, how round this one is. And the smooth white violet is supposedly more rounded. Um, but that there seems to be a lot of variation there. Yeah, and that brings us to the end of all our flower pictures and gives you the resource page. Um, my email is claudia at hassanvalleyfarm.org. I'm happy to answer questions, to look at pictures of flowers that you find. Um, I'm always happy to, to receive interesting things, um, to learn more by seeing what other people have seen. Our website um, is hvfarmscape.org and um, it's a great resource for all sorts of organisms um, in wild creatures in Columbia County. There's something about butterflies and dragonflies and ground beetles, um, but also specifically about the flora and there's more resources there. And of course, there's the checklist of the flora of Columbia County. So that's the link for that. Um, and I also want to point you to two web resources by other organizations. The New York Flora Atlas of the New York Flora Association is a wonderful resource where you can um, look up plants and you can get distribution maps of where the plants are known from within New York. They have good information about habitat affinity for plants. Um, and then Go Botany is the uh, website of the Native Plant Trust, the former New England Wildflower Society out in Massachusetts. And I like that website a lot because um, it really makes a point of trying to show all of our wild growing plants in different stages. So. Um, when you go on the website and and you type in a plant species, it shows you a whole set of images of that plant at different stages in its life. Um, and then some books that I um, like a lot and would recommend um, as resources. The Spring Flowers of the Northeast by Gracie Carroll. It's a lot of wonderful information and, and beautiful, beautiful pictures of um, the spring flowers. And of course, Rogers McGuaw's Flora of Columbia County. That one is still available for a very cheap price at the New York State Museum. Make sure to um, ask them to give you also the index because the index was printed separately and sometimes you get a book without an index and that's not very helpful. And then free digital versions of the Flora of Columbia County are also available. Um, on our website, cannot put them there, um, courtesy of the New York State Library. Newcomb's Wildflower Guide is my um, guide that I carry with me at all times. Um, some people think it has too much stuff in it, but I like it because it does have shrubs and vines as well as, as wildflowers. And once, once you've taken a little bit of time getting used to its classification system, it's actually a really handy and, and easy to use resource. Um, there's a nice book that's called The, the Secrets of Wildflowers um, that I also like as a, as a resource and a lot of the, the lore that I tell about plants on our plant walks comes, comes from this book. And then um, if you're just interested in learning more about the natural history of Columbia County in general, I highly recommend Conrad's book, The Nature of the Place, which is out of press. You might still pick it up used somewhere. Um, or again, um, Conrad made a, a free PDF available for download. And you can go to the, to the website and just grab it there. And with that, I will thank you for your attention and say goodbye. And I'm looking forward to getting emails from you. <laughs> All right.